Well, it was about 1961, 62, graduating from college. A friend of mine and I decided to drive up the highway and see what Alaska had to offer, adventure. Basically was it. Claire Heiner had the Mini B, and I heard that they'd had a $20,000 man share on there for the year. Yeah. I kind of liked that idea. Of course, in those days, you couldn't get a job on a hard on a crab boat unless you, you knew somebody or you're part of the family. One day, George Johnson come down, and you have to understand, I was working in the processor. In those days, the George Johnsons and the, and the big-time crab fishermen were kind of like seeing Willie Mays or Willie McCovey come walking by. You know, everybody knew who they were in town, small town, and you're kind of, you're a little bit in awe of them. So he came up, walked right up to me, wanted to know if I want to go crab fishing. I about fell overboard. It's the money. There's good money in it. And, uh, of course, uh, that stuff spreads fast. Once somebody starts making it, well, that's the way it goes. Well, when I first got to Seattle, I had $80 in my pocket, and I was fortunate enough to run into Jerry Oaksmith, who introduced me to Bill Ritter, who in turn hired me in, uh, with his company as a processor. And I, that was my start uh, in Alaska. And that, in those days, if you were willing to come early, stay late, work hard, uh, there's a lot of opportunity. In 66, when we had the Juno, we caught 5.4 million pounds of king crab with that boat, 11 months of fishing. And we grossed $540,000. And when you gross $540,000, the crewmen on our vessels were making $54,000 a year. So in 66, I mean, $54,000 was a lot of money for uh, anybody's language, you know. Well, I remember what the, the first year I worked, I'd actually calculated out. I made more money than my father had made in five years. Now, in those days, you could go on the work deck of a boat with rain gear and a pair of boots and actually dream that you could own the boat someday. And I was raised on a small farm there where there's no way you could work on a tractor and think you were ever going to own the man's farm. But there really was a dream in those days that you could start and work your way where you can actually own the enterprise that you're on. And I don't know how many enterprises there are where the laboring man just worked. It's all it was was a strong back could dream that kind, kind of dream. Ed Shields is a throwback to the age of working sail. During the pre-war era, his family operated cod schooners in Alaska. After the war, they were among the pioneers who trawled for king crab in the Bering Sea. He remembers the Japanese crab vessels that crowded around the cod boats, where king crab devoured the fish wastes. Like the other American pioneers, the Shields family resented the intrusion. I was aboard the Charles Wilson, a three-mast schooner, and my father was on the Sophie Christensen. The Japanese were uh, encroaching on the Bristol Bay salmon fishing area. So he sent a telegram to Seattle ordering a dozen high-powered rifles for each vessel and a case of ammunition each. The Coast Guard didn't care for this at all. The State Department didn't care for it. But the news media did. It made good news. There was no television at that time. But they did get um, in the national magazines like Time and Life and the adverse publicity to Japanese manufactured goods was so severe at that time from this campaign the Japanese decided to pull out of Bristol Bay area and he sent a telegram down saying Bristol Bay is all clear now Japanese gone home Lowell Wakefield was the marketing genius who led the American entry into King Crab Lowell Wakefield was a real visionary. He, he was a man that had, had a vision that sometimes was difficult for the rest of us to see, but he believed that king crab 
could be the gourmet food of, of the 20th century. I guess if it was a true grandfather of the present industry, it was Low Wakefield. Well, basically, the, the problem was that the resource was so healthy that we were catching more crab than we could actually process. And so we had to figure out methods to process crab faster and put it into a form that could be sold domestically. Uh, Lowell Wakefield, the Wakefield Fisheries, did a tremendous job in, in innovating uh, crab in the shell. Well, the Japanese dominated the market with the canned product. And the Geisha brand was world, world known and, and probably the market leader by a significant degree. And Lowell always believed that you cannot compete with, with the canned product. And the story is that he learned that crab froze extremely well because he had started off his career in canning and one night they didn't have time to can all the products so he thought he was putting it in a cooler and it ended up being in the freezer and the, the product froze and when they thought it out they realized that it was probably a superior way to preserve the product in canning. By the way, uh, Lowell, what does the future hold for this industry? Lowell, this, I'm sure, is one of the bright spots of our great state of Alaska. I think that the king crab industry has a terrific future and a lot of special meaning because most of our traditional fisheries, the big ones for salmon and for halibut, are summertime fisheries. This one is a wintertime fishery, bringing in dollars to Alaska fishermen, processing workers and business people at the time of year when we need it the most. While Wakefield was first, the Shields family wasn't far behind. First uh, inkling I had of a king crab in Bering Sea was in 1947 when I was uh, one of the crew members aboard the uh, C.A. Thayer. The deep sea was up there that year. This was Wakefield's boat. It was a brand new uh, East Coast style side rig dragger, about 135 feet long, very modern, a very, very good, capable boat. Uh, my father could hear this on the radio every day as to how many crab they were bringing in, and it sounded very good. The family bought a 148-foot surplus wooden army freighter, rigged it as a side trawler, and christened it the Nordic Maid. We were fishing with trawl nets. Everything came aboard in one big bag and was dumped on deck. If there were a lot of uh, good fishing, we'll say, uh, we might have five or six or eight hundred crabs, king male crabs, in that net, and maybe five hundred females. Uh, they're a, a strong-bodied animal, so we could stand on top of the pile of king crab without materially hurting them. We would pick the male crabs out and throw them across the deck to the other side where they were going to be butchered, and we had an open port in the side of the rail, and the uh, females were scooted out through that port. Even as the American presence grew on the crab grounds, the Japanese remained on the scene, fishing with tangle nets from their Kawasaki boats. I remember one time when the uh, Charles Wilson in 47, um, we were just laying an anchor on a day that was too rough for us to fish. The Japanese boat came alongside of us, and they were begging for food. They wanted something more to eat. Uh, they had been in their boat uh, probably 10 hours, maybe more that day. Uh, all that they had to eat while they were aboard was what small crab that they could take out of the net. And they had a charcoal brazier on the back of the boat. And they put the uh, crabs on that and cooked them and picked the meat out uh, to eat during the day. But otherwise, they had nothing else to eat all day. Cap Thompson was a Western Alaskan entrepreneur who struck it rich on the crab grounds. Cap Thompson is, uh, is, a, is a legend that uh, in, the, in the crab days there that he was uh, extremely competitive. It, it wasn't unheard of that he would uh, uh, go across the bay and catch a boat underneath the Panalaska's dock uh, under the hoist due to unload in the morning, bring a bottle of whiskey in. And when they had a couple of drinks, he had moved the boat himself under his own hoist and have it unloaded before uh, Panalaska woke up the next day. I think uh, Captain Thompson drove his competitors nuts. 
Plying the waters of western Alaska, Thompson observed the activities of Wakefield and the other crab pioneers. Armed with a three-page instructional pamphlet published by the Fish and Wildlife Service, he resolved to launch a processing operation. He acquired a barge and a processing line that some of Wakefield's men had experimented with, then discarded. He announced the establishment of the Aleutian King Crab Company. And then I, I put an ad in the Kodiak newspaper that I was going to process crab in the Aleutian Islands and uh, was uh, urging p p fishermen to come out there. And so two power scouts showed up from Kodiak. And uh, when they came, of course, I said to them, look, I don't have a nickel to buy a crab with, but I know where the crab are. And if you're willing to wait, uh, I'd never processed a crab before. Why, uh, I'll buy your crab. And I was in it for five years. Uh, total investment. Uh, for a Lucian King Crab was $1,610 and sold it for four million in five years. At that time, that was money, of course, then. Bob Resoff was another pioneer who would strike it rich in King Crab. A Russian Aleut from the tiny village of Nanilchik, he built company after company and sold them to Fortune 500 firms like W.R. Grace and ConAgra. As a businessman, says a contemporary, Resoff always knew when to hold them and when to fold them. He got his start at the poker table. Well, in a way, I spent five years in the service. And uh, the most pleasure we had was playing poker and dice. And I had a fairly lucky streak. So when I could discharge, I... <coughs> had about 45,000 bucks. And I, that's when my start. Alec McGlashan, a Scots Aleut native of Dutch Harbor, served as second harpooner on a whaling ship before signing aboard Wakefield's Deep Sea in 1948. Though he had never worked aboard a trawler, they made him foreman of the deck crew. Oh, I guess from 50 to three, 400 to drag, which dragged an hour. And there really three, four hundred to drag. Yeah. I seen one drag that had, had eleven hundred in it. That was the biggest drag you ever had. <laughs> yeah. Lloyd Cannon was among the first Americans on the crab grounds in the post-war era. First of all, my father had got some tangle gear, and that would have been in the winter of forty-seven. And I was going to school, but on weekends I'd go out in Calch and Middle Bay and help him pull his tangle gear, you know, all by hand off the bottom and untangling the crab out of the nets. You know, the Japanese style, they cut the nets and pull the crab out. My father couldn't afford to cut the nets, so we sat there tediously and untangled. Uh, you know, we didn't catch very many crab. If we had a crab, we got, day we got 25 crab, it was a big day. and. They sold them on the street corners in Kodiak. Joe Kurtz and the Cook Inlet pioneers in the village of Seldovia decided pots might be the answer to a more efficient crab harvest. They built the first king crab pots out of the frames of surplus army cots. Took the springs out and knocked the pots apart. It was easy to do. It took a heavy hammer and heavy chisel and one whack and you cut the rivets. They uh, put the, we put, st stood two of them up on edge and cut the third one in two and took the pieces that we got out of that for uh, the end pieces. And that ended up with a pot that was about four feet by, really it was 63 inches because that's what a army cot was. Other fishermen had experimented with enlarged versions of the round Dungeness crab pot used to the south, but they proved too light to properly tend bottom in rugged Alaskan waters. The Seldovia bed frames produced a superior king crab trap because they were heavier. Industry leaders began experimenting with pot frames made of three-quarter inch iron rod, then one inch rod. When we first started, we had a uh, different type of pots. It was uh, round pots, and they only weighed about 100, 150 pounds at the most. Now they're square pots, seven by seven. And they uh, 
uh, way up to seven, eight hundred pounds. And of course, they uh, fish a lot more too. More and more fishermen became aware of the opportunities in king crab, and the harvest began to mushroom. Meanwhile, Wakefield was making inroads in the marketplace within the shell product, especially in the New England states where bright red king crab emerged as an affordably priced substitute for lobster. By the mid-1960s, the good times had started to roll. We started fishing in uh, Kodiak in about the month of June, and then we moved on up the line, went to Chicknick, Sand Point, Dutch Harbor, eventually Adak. We stayed in Adak till about uh, March or April, following spring, and then we went back to Seattle, done whatever repair work had to be done on the boat. And in the month of June, we started the cycle all over again. We went to Kodiak and migrated like the crabs. And we could catch more crabs than they could handle on the processors and far more than they could sell. <laughs> so the season in them days was limited to how much money a processor had available to him and how much inventory he could pack. And when he got as much crab as he thought he could sell the rest of the year, everybody stopped and they went down and tried to peddle their products. So in the early days, it wasn't the season that stopped the fishery. It was the ability of the processors to sell a product that they were processing. Stan Tarrant, whose Pacific American Fisheries Company helped finance Wakefield's crabbing ventures, launched an early processing operation at King Cove. They packed 20,000 cases of product, then tried to figure out what to do with it. Uh, we had a problem selling a canned product. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, probably didn't go about it right, but someone conceived the idea in order to dispose of this uh, initial pack of ours, 20,000 cases, to uh, put out a circular with our brokers offering 25 cents if they send the label off of a can of king crab in, we'd send them 25 cents. <laughs> well, of course, that was 1955, but believe it or not, that did it. At first, the crab fleet was a ragtag armada of wooden vessels converted from other fisheries. Although these boats often looked like accidents waiting to happen, the fishermen generally arrived home safely in the early years. I, I think in the early days you had more fishermen that were experienced seamen. Back in those days, a lot of those boats, they, they didn't sink too often because everybody was scared. You know, they always figured they were going to sink, but they didn't sink. And you get these big steel rigs up here now, they're with all the electronics and insulated with all the communications and everything, and they're flopping over left and right. So I think being scared is probably <laughs> was served everybody pretty well. The big profit soon produced much larger steel vessels. Seattle area shipyards began building crab boats at a furious pace. 1960, by then, you know, we wanted to go to Dutch Harbor and ADAC and the Bering Sea, and it wasn't going to be done on a 54-foot boat built in 1917, I'll tell you that. Oscar Dyson's Peggy Joe was one of the first steel boats built exclusively for the crab fishery. From the beginning, Dyson had a clear vision of the industry's future. The king crab, uh a fishery has done more for Alaska and the fishermen than any other uh, fishery. So about 1969, uh, I think uh, we got the first order for a crabber, the Olympic. And of course we designed a totally new boat. Uh, it was a 94-footer. And the boat was very successful. And uh, we immediately got more orders. And um, we'd scoped it out right. You have to build these boats super, super stable because of the load that they put on on crab pots and because of the icing conditions. And super stable and, and sufficient freeboard so that uh, you don't have a stability problem, which is very easy to, uh, to happen. And fortunately, we built uh, a total of 49 of uh, crabbers between 94 and 123 feet, plus the American number one, which is 160 feet. And uh, we haven't had a one of our vessels lost to a stability problem. We feel very lucky about that. Soon, crabbing began to yield extraordinary returns to its practitioners. 
some of whom were astonished at their own achievements. Individuals who lacked the credentials customarily required for shoreside success found that simple hard work paid off handsomely on the crab grounds. On the one hand, crabbing was mere common labor, but it was labor with a difference. In those days, if you just stuck with it, as I say, soon, sooner or later the blind sow would find an acorn and just kept pulling pots. You didn't have to be any genius if you pulled pots and it's full of crab, you must be in the right spot. If it wasn't, you must be wrong, you gotta move. When I first started, uh, the crew got uh, 10 percent of the gross, and, uh, and then the rest went to the boat. The big years was uh, in the 70s, that's so when prices started jumping up, and then there was some terrific shares. There was uh, crew shares up to $100,000 at that time, which uh, uh, was big money in any place. The, the beauty of the, of, the, of the golden years of the crab industry was that all parties made money, not just the packer or not just the fishermen, but we all made money and we made significant amounts of money. During the middle 70s to 1980, it was an absolute phenomenon. I mean, it didn't matter how good a fisherman you really were, no matter where you put your pots, you got fish. You got a lot of king crab and uh, millionaires were made. Boats were paid off in one to two years, million dollar boats. Uh, it was a very lucrative fishery. The market was good. Japan's appetite for the production uh, to be sold there was great. The U.S. market was great. Universal Seafoods bought Vita food products from Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company in January 1976. We paid $19 million for it, most of which was borrowed money and we ended up paying the bank completely off for that purchase in September of that same year. In the 70s there, uh, it wasn't heard of, unheard of of uh, to be able to pay a vessel off in one year. I know it uh, on my first National Marine Fisheries loan because of the length of time it took to get the loan. The day that I received the uh, loan approval, I paid it off. I think uh, the first of the new Marco 108-foot uh, vessels was the Royal Viking, which Corey Ness purchased, and I think that was in probably 1972, thereabouts, and I'm certain he paid it off in the first three months he owned it. That was the era when people were paying 100000 or more just for a spot in the Marco line to have a boat built for them. And if you decided you didn't want to build it for some reason, you could, you could, you could sell your spot in that line for 100000 or more. And, of course, the processors, like Pan Alaska Fisheries, built larger plants so they could produce more volume per day. And we, in fact, one of our plants at Dutch Harbor did over a million pounds a day in production. That was just unheard of. Uh, one vessel, fishing vessel I know of, uh, in fact, the captain was Mr. Sam Yelly, brought in a million pounds in 10 days of king crab in one vessel. Universal developed a, a, a motel bar restaurant called the Unice Inn. And it was not uncommon to see someone order a $5 hamburger and tip the waitress $100. I mean, there was a fantastic amount of money. There, uh, we set up a jewelry store, and we would only sell high-end Seiko watches with gold nuggets and 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 all the gaudy type jewelry you can imagine, uh, watches that were uh, would wholesale for somewhere in the thousand dollars, we'd sell them for three thousand dollars and we couldn't keep the shelves full enough. The Alaska king crab fishery served as the launching pad for steel vessel construction. The Northwest Cadillacs built by yards like Marco and the Pacific fishermen were legendary for their toughness, but the advent of steel didn't make the fishery as a whole any safer. Lots of my friends are left left the world up there in that ocean. It was just pretty intense. And you're always working on the fine, fine edge of getting yourself pretty exhausted in those days. And of course, the competition got greater and greater. And uh, 
they had the fish, regardless of the weather. They had the, uh, uh, if you wanted to catch your share of crab, you had to go there. It was blown 50, 60, uh, whatever. You still had to go out the fish. Of course, that made it more risky. You know, I think every young man, when he goes, if he thinks he's invincible and happy to somebody else, it's not going to happen to me. And the fishing, you're going in for the money. And so you're, you take more risk for money. I've often said uh, going fishing in the Bering Sea or even into the Gulf of Alaska, if you're lucky like I was, you find your destiny. If you're unlucky, you find your fate. There's been as much sorrow as there has profit come out of the Bering Sea. That's for sure. In 1980, vessels in Alaskan waters produced record landings of 180 million pounds of king crab. In 1981, Pre-season trawl surveys conducted by biologists from the National Marine Fisheries Service reported a drastic drop in crab populations. At first, the fishermen were incredulous and attributed the reports to the scientists' shortcomings as fishermen. When the 1981 season began, however, an exceedingly painful reality began to emerge. Something had devastated the crab stocks. Well, you could ask all the scientists, they don't know. There's all kinds of uh, answers given by the scientists that there was a major interruption in nature, that there was a disease found in some of the crab. I think one would have to reach the conclusion that the, especially king crab cannot withstand a commercial fishery. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know whether it was overfishing. I know when I first started in the Bering Sea, there were the, the Russians and the Japanese out there with tangle nets and gear, and we fished. We'd go 10 days lucky to get one tank, tank of crab. And, and that, that was slow, slow fishing, seven, eight, six, seven, eight hours for a couple of years. And all of a sudden, we had a period of six, seven years where we caught more crab every year and the stocks kept going up. We, we, and the quotas, we went up because the stocks went, were on an increase. And so I don't really know if it's, uh, I think it's, it's too complex for this little brain to to comprehend. The high-flying crab industry was brought to its knees. You know, values of vessels that may have been worth a million and a half dollars at that time, you could buy them on the street down here for three or four hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it was, you know, this the boy shout is what it was. And we basically had nothing to do. We owned companies that were geared to uh, processing in a very short period of time, this large quantity of crab, and then suddenly we had nothing to do. Uh, at the end of 1981, when, when the disaster came, uh, Pacific Pearl and the Wakefields and the Pan Alaskas, uh, uh, they went by the wayside. And uh, for instance, in Akatan, we had 13 processors in Akatan. Today we have one. You know, and I think the real professional fishermen, very few of them went broke. They staggered along and fished some snow crab and tendered some salmon and managed to make a living and survive and make their payments. In our case, we had built a cold storage in Redmond and we had the Unice Inn and that was the only revenue producing things for, for Universal Seafoods at that time. So you reduce your staff, you do everything you can to uh, stay alive, but uh, it wasn't much of an existence. Uh, one of the things, though, that happened that is a plus is that a lot of the innovative fishermen decided that, well, we've got to do something else with our vessels. And that's when we really, in essence, started up our trawling industry. Today, vessels still ply the Alaska king crab grounds. And because of sky-high prices, fishermen whose boats are paid for can still make a handsome living stalking the big crustaceans. Nevertheless, the king crab fishery of today is a dramatically different enterprise, and young fishermen out to seek their fortunes are hard-pressed to repeat the experience of the pioneers. You know, I got my start with a pair of hip boots and a skiff. Now a young man can't get a start in the fishery unless he's got an awful rich relative or something like this because entry permits cost too much, vessels cost too much, and. You know, you couldn't go get a 40-foot boat and go out and say, I'm going to fish crab along the shore here, and as soon as I make enough money, I'm going to build a bigger boat. Those days are gone forever. <laughs>